What's up, everyone? We are watching a highlight from a prior podcast with Matt Berkey, who is hot in the news, fresh off winning a GPI award for his podcast, as well as the heads up match, of course, versus Nick Airball. They're battling high stakes, a lot of talk, a lot of excitement in the poker world. Let me know what you guys think about heads up matches in general. And would you play in that something like that? You like that one-on-one -on -one kind of format would that, against someone that you you feel like it would either you'd have an edge or it would be interesting or you just want to battle. Like, do you think that uh, um, is that something that would be? Do you think would um, your style I, well? Uh, eh, I don't know. I, I'm I'm definitely not a heads-up specialist. It's ironic because I, I just said I had one of the best cash months of my life, and most of it was heads-up, but uh, it's deep stack cash. So like. Heads up, deep stack cash, nine-handed deep stack cash, whatever. I feel very comfortable in that realm. Um, playing heads up in a, a turbo sit-and-go format, I really don't think I'm going to have an edge unless I take a lot of time and study. Um, so I guess I would need to be incentivized to do so. I really do think the dual format is cool, though. Like, uh, I like the idea of it being like this uh, almost like boxer contender type setup where you know both players have an entry-level position uh, in this instance, it was a fifty thousand dollars buy-in, and then the winner advances, and the loser has the op option to uh, challenge them again. Now for double the prize pool, yeah. and should he pass, now just a new contender comes in at the hundred k level, and then the two hundred k level, and the four hundred. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's really cool. I think it it's set up in a very sort of like video game format where right. you could just have Ivy sitting waiting at like the eight hundred k level as the end boss. Uh, should anybody yeah. dare like go that far? Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of of sit and go formats, but um, that's just kind of being nitpicky. I just turned into a complete grinder. I would play 16 hours a day, uh, not because I wanted to, but because I just wanted to have enough money to be free to go play live cash again. And between August of 2009 and February of 2010, uh, I just mashed. I think I won like I don't know three or four hundred thousand, uh, culminating in chopping the full tilt seven fifty k for mm -hmm. one hundred and ten thousand. Uh, mm -hmm. And with every score, I would like buy a bigger piece of myself. So by the time I I chopped the seven fifty k, I think I might have had like seventy percent of myself or something of that nature. Um, so you know, I went from broke to having like a, a sixty or seventy k roll within six months. I proved to myself that I could win online. Um, and from there, it just spun up. I started playing live cash again. I had a 50K month playing 510, followed by a 50K uh, Venetian tournament score where I got second, and then the deep run in the main event. So suddenly I had like 350K, uh, having been broke less than a year earlier. Um, and that was the best thing and the worst thing that could have happened to me at the time. I was just... I had never had that kind of money and I was only 28. So uh, I felt invincible. I felt like I had more money than I could ever need in life. So I started playing 10, 20, 40. I was doing really well. Um, I think I won like a quarter million that summer uh, playing the Bellagio game. Uh, and I didn't know what to do with all my money. So I just started backing everybody I knew. And <laughs> yeah, they, exactly. That's how it goes, yeah, right? You don't know what to invest in. So you invest in what you know, right? And I was just, Backing a bunch of my friends who weren't as dedicated as me and weren't learning. And I was arrogant enough to think that like I could help them. Um, but we were just on very, very different levels. And eventually I lost like a little over 200 in backing. Uh, I went on a small downswing myself. And by 2012, I was broke again. Um, so that was a massive, massive learning process for me. Uh, Call it luck, good fortune, preparation, whatever. Uh, I spent most of 2012 broke. And uh, by the time 2013 had rolled around, uh, I had scraped together some money from a friend, final tabled an event at the wind, started playing small cash, ran it up, sold a package to the summer, final tabled three events, and I had half a million dollars by August of 2013. Um, so once that happened, uh, I was lucky enough to be good friends with Bob Bright who never knew that I went broke and basically had been teasing me with an invite to the big game uh, at Aria for the better part of 18 months. 
Yeah. Uh, I finally had the opportunity to take him up on it. So they were playing 200, 400, uh, 20K min. And he was like, yeah, we're, we need players. Uh, you just had a good summer. Why don't you come in? We love tournament players. That's what he would always say. We're like, well, we love tournament players in this game. It's like, okay. Uh, so I went in there, started playing 2-4. Uh, kind of got my head kicked in a little bit in the early goings. Lost like um, 60,000 where I had half of myself. And then the game got kicked up like almost immediately to 3-6-12. Mm-hmm. So um, I was lucky that I had, you know, friends of friends that had a lot of faith in me. I was able to sell a big piece, uh, eventually just getting full time backing and was playing three, six, 12 for the better part of six and a half years, uh, wow. give or take. Um, and that was just, you know, that was the ultimate turning point. Just getting into that game was was never looking back. I, I mean, I enjoy playing the most. And honestly, like in a perfect world, I would have just remained anonymous and no one would have ever known my name and I would have disappeared into the sunset making however much I was making. Um, I don't like the public eye. That was a big hesitancy whenever I was planning on doing this. Like I never wanted to be a big Twitter persona. I never wanted to. But the other thing is that like I am outspoken. I do have opinions. uh, So I enjoy having a platform. Um, Mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed growing the brand. I like creative projects. I, I like everything that we've done in the process of doing this, um, I've grown to love things like the podcast, the streams, uh, you know, basically like utilizing the platform to, to speak my mind on whatever the topic at hand is. Mm -hmm. Um, if I had to, if, if this had never happened and I was presented the opportunity to start the same product again today, I wouldn't. Um, and even if I could go all the way back to 2016, uh and somebody gave me the opportunity to start the same process or not i probably wouldn't have just because uh i don't think i could have predicted that the market was going to be this competitive and i already think that the ceiling is relatively low in uh poker training so uh it's one of those things where it's more of a passion project than it is um something that's gonna you know make me a lot of passive income or or make me rich in some sort of capacity but i do think that the skills that I've acquired from a business acumen sense, uh, as well as the potential to leap into other markets moving forward is probably going to be invaluable in the future. This is wow. something that I've been talking about for a long time where I said that Daniel's untouchable uh, in the sense that we can't build a personality as big as him. because right. not, not, not because Daniel can't be replicated, but because we'll never have the same machine that Daniel had when Stars was fully backing him for the better part of a decade, right? They put him on every single cash game televised event. They put him in every single major buy-in that was on TV, right? We don't have that. We'll never have that sort of churn behind any singular person. But Doug's as close as we got. Doug reached the ceiling of how far you can independently take yourself uh, in this game. And now he's leveraging Daniel to close the gap even further. Right now, he's taking Daniel's platform and leveraging it against him to ensure that Doug gets much closer to a Negranu than Daniel just being on an island of untouchable. Right. Yeah, it's kind of funny too because they both have you know in, in poker now that like you said it's competitive, but there's there's only a handful of courses I could basically rattle them off: raise your edge, um, you know, solve for why. Uh, you got learn. Po- there's like there's six, seven upswing. Masterclass, Dave and you know Daniel and I. So it's kind of like these coaching platforms battling. Like I mean, Doug could just have a field day with the clips, the content, yeah. the hands, the reviews. Like he's basically yeah. It, it's interesting. I'm I'm just um I'm just I'm curious on it. So it's I, I sort of fall where you're saying on it. it's a bit uh a bit bit unclear on the motivate like what why Daniel want to do that. But um you know I think I he know. just wants to punch the bully in the nose. You know I right. think that like he's he's uh egotistical enough to think that he has a fighter's chance. Um, which he may, you know, he may be able to train himself up to that point, but, uh, it's, it's not like they're meeting in the middle somewhere, you know, they're not playing six max where Doug is hardly an expert and Daniel is a no limit holding player and could maybe get there. They're not playing a tournament format where Daniel has a ton of expertise, right? They're literally playing the game that Doug built his career off of and Daniel's trying to play catch up. Yeah, I mean, we're on the trajectory that I've I've foreseen from the beginning, but because of COVID, uh, it's given us the freedom to kind of ramp things up. So pre-COVID, we were releasing content on our training site daily. Um, and that's just daunting, right? It's like Christian and I have to make 
maybe uh, four pieces of content a month. Uh, the other coaches that are on staff, uh, Jack and Matt, they're doing the same. And it, it takes a lot of time. You know, we probably put like 30 hours plus into each course uh, and we were doing it monthly. So when COVID hit, uh, I was just kind of like, you know, we can't keep up this pace because naturally we're just going to lose uh, some clientele. People just aren't going to be able to afford poker training during this time. And right. we're not going to be able to afford keeping uh, a full production staff uh, on hand. So we kind of basically found a way to uh, scale everything back. We dropped our price. I was going to honestly just do it for free uh, during the entire COVID just to, to um, use it as like a loss leader. Um, mm -hmm. But I got convinced to do it at $9.99 instead, which is essentially free. And now we're just releasing one piece of content a week, which is no burden to anyone. Um, and because of that, it gives us a lot of time and effort to put on to the, to the other things. Um, you know, our biggest strength is our production crew, Pigtails. Uh, we have a documentary that's coming out soon, probably in the next month. Uh, it's going to be on our site in Poker Go. Um, so I'm looking forward to that releasing. We're also doing a, um, a seven part course, um, sort of designated towards beginners that is all, uh, whiteboard videos. Um, so that's going to launch, I think in three weeks, um, we're going to drop, uh, each part monthly, um, and each course will have, uh, seven lessons. So it's seven part curriculum with seven or sorry, it's a seven course curriculum with seven lessons per course. Uh, okay. so we'll be putting out a new course every month, uh, using these whiteboard videos. Um, yeah, you know, it's just an opportunity to get creative. It's an opportunity to test, uh, like I said, see where the boundaries lie in the market. Um, I just think there's a lot that isn't really being addressed in poker that we can uh, potentially latch onto and and push forward on. I, I just grew up in a very poor suburb of Pittsburgh, uh, very blue collar. It was a steel mill town. Uh, by the time I was a senior in high school, the steel mill had shut down. Now it's like, uh, you know, I go back and it's it's very destitute. Uh, the The whole town has kind of like, turned into low income housing, uh, you know, a lot of uh, drug issues and things like that. You know, the, the normal things that you see on the outskirts of a major city, whenever you start to get into the rural areas. Um, so yeah, I mean, I graduated with like 53 people, uh, very, very small, but we were a stone's throw away from the city, maybe like 15, 20 minutes. Um, and yeah, I, I had a great childhood. I can't really complain. Obviously, uh, I had certain struggles growing up super poor, but Nothing really, you know, too outlandish. Um, got into poker kind of as a way to blend with... Uh, uh, so I played baseball in college. And, you know, as a freshman, you get hazed a ton. And part of that is drinking, but I've never drank. So, uh, you know, in order to kind of like blend with the upperclassmen and still maintain my own personal moral high ground, I guess, um, poker like served me there. It was something that I dabbled with in high school. And, you know, whenever I was getting a lot of peer pressure from them to drink, I would just be like, oh, you know, like, uh, I don't drink, but I gamble. Like, let's play cards. And they accepted that. They were super happy about it. Um, by the time I was a junior, the moneymaker boom hit. So, you know, long road trips, we were playing on the bus. We were organizing tournaments, all these things. And I was 21 at the time. So uh, I, I just started going to casinos and doing well.